All right, we're going with it. This is the recording that's happening. No retakes. Hey guys, my name's Jay Wilson here. I'm a, uh, what am I? I'm a consultant. Uh, I am an advice giver on the Domo platform. Um, you can reach me at jae at onyxreporting.com or find me on the Domo Dojo. Hey, Sharon posted a question at our last meetup and she was saying, hey, I've got this requirement where I'm trying to do a forecast. And more specifically, I want to build a forecast based off of whatever the um, sales values were 12 months ago times a, uh, a multiplier that will change from month over month. Hope that makes sense. What is the best way to go about doing this in Domo? Um, I've been having a lot of debates with people about the best way to do anything. Um, so I'm not actually going to touch it. I'm not going to talk about the best way, but I will show you a way um, that will allow you to build this forecast that I just showed um, using some pretty straightforward tools. In the underlying data set, um, I've got some sample real estate data. So I've got the date an activity happened, and then I have the quantity or the volume will be our number of interest. Or maybe it's units. I forget what we did for the math. Um, then I'll have a forecast table. Now, um, to do the forecast, right, remember Sharon's requirement was every month I have a different actual forecast. So let's say 78%, 53%, 78% because it's seasonal. But to be conservative, I want to be able to track a low and a maximum of like this range of values. Like let's say if I'm doing a what if analysis or something along those lines, right? So one row per date. Okay. Um, I did, Alexis, you'll love this. I did end up doing a magic ETL data flow um, just because it's easy. Um, but you'll notice instead of doing a join, which I think mo where, is where most people's brains gravitate, gravitate toward, instead of doing a join, I do an append. So let's look at my columns. I pull in my real estate forecast. I'm going to add a column called activity type and set it to forecast. And then for all of my transactions, I will add an activity type called actual. When I append my rows, I'll keep all columns. Um, this is a model that I call building a stacked data set where I ha 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 stack the data instead of joining it. So I create a really tall data set instead of a very wide data set. And one of the reasons why I like this approach is that when you work with a stacked data set, you don't have to worry about blowing out your forecast values um, or worrying about a max or a min or like an average or anything like that. You can just deal with the actual value because it's not duplicated across potentially many rows. So nice, clean, easy um, stack where the output data set again has all of the columns that are related to um, forecast and then as I scroll down to my actuals the date the columns related to the forecast are null but the columns related to the actual activity are filled in. Now if there was overlap like let's say there was a salesperson associated with an activity and each salesperson had a quota then for each month each salesperson would have their quota. So there you'd have like, let's say I have five salespeople. I have five pe people per row for January, five people per row for February and so on. Um, you deal with that as you come across it. Anyway, let's go about building our um, card. Again, keep in mind, we didn't do any math in the ETL and that's the important part to me. Um, I want to simplify my ETL. In the grand scheme of life, I would rather use something like Data Assembler or maybe the um, the new, uh, what's it called? Data Views beta feature. I would rather use either of those tools to stack my data, to append my data, if it were possible. Um, but both of them require a overlapping schema. Like they have to have the same schema. And that might be a little bit too challenging to do in the UI as it's currently provided, hence why I opted for Magic ETL. Um, before you build a, t a card, like a t bar graph or anything like that, I always recommend get it so you can see the results that you're looking for in a table card, and then it will always work as a bar chart or what have you. 
So let's see if we can stitch all of this together. I'm going to show dates, but instead of showing dates by quarter, I'm going to show dates by month because she has a monthly forecast. And then I want to start by showing my quantity column, which is called units. So let me take the sum of units. Oh, that's a terrible number. That's too small. Let's go with that other column. What was the other metric called? I should have paid attention. Sorry, guys. Volume. Maybe? Yeah, that looks like a nice big fat number. Cool. To make sure it makes sense, I'm going to sort by date with no aggregation descending. So this is interesting, right? Because because I stacked volume, sorry, because I stacked actuals and transactions, um, my data of actuals ends in April, but my data of the, like the forecast goes all the way through the end of December, which is represented in my data. So for grins, I'm gonna pull in my forecast numbers, which are actual, and I'll show min, I probably could have picked a more descriptive name. Low, it was called. Yeah, I'll, so I'll show my low side, my upside, right? This is my what if analysis, right? So I don't have to do a sum because I know, I know there's one row per month, but just to be consistent, I'll say, I'll pretend like it's an aggregation or an aggregation is required. Cool. So remember, the math for the forecast was I my forecast is based off of the same value last year or functionally the same value 12 months ago and if you've been following my YouTube channel you know that you can use a windowed function with a lag to calculate the same value 12 months ago so we're going to take the lag the sum of volume if I could type And we're going to partition it. Sorry, we're not going to partition. We're going to window over. No partition, but we'll order by the date. Ascending. Ooh, I can't decide if it's going to be ascending or descending. Also, it's 12 months. So I'm going to lag 12. And we'll call this volume lag 12 and let's just do a quick sniff test to make sure I'm not making a mess now oh, you went in the wrong place come over here all right so let's look for this 2005 2 million oh I can read large numbers 2 million five 2 million five was December 2020 so in December 2019 did I have 2 million five? I did. So I do have that lag that I'm expecting, or I know that my lag is working as expected. Cool. So that's the, let's call this volume previous year. And again, one more time for the cheap sheet, cheap seats. The metric of interest is the sum of volume, which I'm lagging. 12 months because my my card is grouped by month and to because I'm using a lag function I do have to pass an explicit date order so I'm ordering by date ascending I'm going to copy this function and I'll create a new function and this is going to be the forecast I'll call it forecast instead of forecast actual I'll call it forecast expected and I'll take that lagged value times the sum of my forecast, which is called actual. What a stupid name. I'm sorry, that's a terrible name. But if it uh, checks out, I should be able to put that next to. All right, let's see if this checks out. So my volume 12 months ago was 200. Oh, God, I can't read large numbers. 2.5 million multiplied by 0.78%. Does that come out at 2 million? Eh, let's say yes, right? And I can do rinse, wash, and repeat for actuals and low and, and so on. And so if I remove those columns, this is my forecast. 
Burr, 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 burr. We win. Do you guys want to stay on like for another five minutes and like watch me demo something live that I probably shouldn't demo live? I'm going to do it. I'm doing it, guys. It's happening. This is cool, right? I can have a forecast and say, this is what I predicted. But what might be intriguing would be if you could answer, well, Jay, I see what you forecasted at the beginning of the year. And you, you know how sometimes you do a re-forecast in the middle of the year? How good are you at forecasting, right? Because if, if you only look at what the forecast is today, but you never evaluate how, how good your forecasting is, you don't really know if you're good at forecasting. I'm using the word way too often. This is annoying me. That's OK. Let's go back to my forecast table. And um, let's say, hypothetically, we add a model called forecast, period. Let's say this is the um, 2020 um, Q1 forecast. Yeah, I'll pull that all the way through. Is that actually going to work? <gasps> I love it. They updated. Oh, beautiful. OK, so that's our 2020 forecast. And uh, let's assume that mid-year, so let's assume mid-year I do a second forecast. Or let's say at the end of April, I do a new forecast. And this time, this will be the Q2 forecast, right? And uh, now I need to adjust these values. So we had a coronavirus happened, so it, our forecast just went terrible. OK, I'm not going to update the other values. Cool, so it got, ter it got ugly. Now, I need to go back into my ETL, right? Because I just added a new column. Hmm. Yeah, OK, fine. That'll work fine. Let's save and run. This is exciting. I don't know. Maybe you're not excited. I think this is great. This is this is what I think about all day. <laughs> How to do more. OK, so the values are 2020 Q1 and 2020 Q2. Yeah, OK. Let's go into my data now, my card, rather. Please tell me I saved the card. So now, as is, it kind of looks right, but notice this forecast is overstated. It's too high. And the reason why this forecast is too high is because I added a forecast. I need to uh, choose between the Q1 forecast and the two Q2 forecast. But what's interesting, and this is why I kind of paused for a sec, if I choose the Q1 forecast, all of my transactional data goes away because there is no value for the thing. Now, if I include null, which is my actual activity, well, Domo's terrible at filtering on null, so this is all bad. So what if I take this and I say, OK, this forecast is going to be the Q1 forecast? Well, now, <laughs> oh boy. The actual column, remember the actual column was my poorly labeled forecast column. I'm going to put a case statement in here. Case when forecast period is equal to 2020 Q1, then give me the actual end. Now, if this works properly, we should go back down. And let me remove my filters. 
So if my forecast Q1 worked properly, the value should have gone down, but it looks like it did not work properly. 2020 underscore Q1. What did I type? A hyphen. I'm going to copy this. Please work. Hey, -o! we're back to the Q1 forecast. Now I can compare it to the Q2 forecast. I don't know why Google's talking to me. Forecast. Sorry, I'm not sure how to help. Hey, Google. Quiet, please. Google's talking at me. Shh, we have to whisper. OK. Guys, I hope you're as excited about this as I am. This just got cool. So now what's really cool here, right? And this is actually something that I really strongly encourage you to think about if you're doing any forecasting. You know, in Domo, you have the ability to like project what we think the next three periods are going to be or whatever. But if you don't compare what your forecast was versus what, versus what it actually, um, any sort of adjustments or versus what it actually ended up being, then in the grand scheme of life, like you don't know how good you are at forecasting. But by building into your data set the ability to both keep that history and do that comparison, you'll very much um, strengthen your ability to, you know, do better forecasting in the future. Cool. We're not quite done, right? Because in the grand scheme of life, Sharon's like, Jay, I don't want to see the full history of since 2016. I'm only interested in the last 12 months. And I know you're thinking to yourselves, guys, well, if I filter on the date, what happens? Well, you, I'll just tell you the answer. You don't want to filter on date. The reason why you don't want to filter on date is because if I filter on all of the activity in the last, let's say, um, since January 1st, it will eliminate all of the historical data from my data set that my previous year column relies on. So I can't apply a filter. What I can do is I can apply a limit of 12 rows. Because what the limit does is it just changes how much stuff I'm able to see without actually filtering the amount of data that I'm processing or have access to um, in, my, in my visualization. You could say, yeah, but Jay, I guess you could filter on two years, but then I have those extra years that I'm not interested in. We're going all over the place. At the end of, at the, end of the day, um, Sharon, this is your solution. You can drop this into a pie, you can't do a pie chart, I don't know why that's the first thing that comes to mind. You can do a bar chart, you can do a group bar, whatever, but what I've um, been able to do is we used magic ETL to stack the data, and then we used a lag function to um, pull in the previous year, which we then multiplied by the forecast amount. And then I took it a step further by adding the ability to compare what my forecast was at the start of Q1 versus my adjusted f forecast in Q2. And right, because coronavirus happened, look how strong um, the impact is or the changes between Q1 and Q2. That's the kind of stuff you want to keep track of. Cool. My name is Jay Wilson. You can find me on the Domo Dojo or in our global Slack channel. Please subscribe to my YouTube video, and uh, we'll catch you guys later. Bye.